then uh, we will get into tonight's lesson. All right, so uh, I've titled this lesson tonight, Paul, Our Pattern. Uh, the subtitle is For Doing the Will of God. I was surprised to see that we really didn't have a lesson uh, with this title on the, on the website. We have hundreds and hundreds of lessons, and uh, if you go to the graceambassadors.com slash index page, it'll list them all, all the lessons and articles and email tips and everything else. And I turned on my little web browser find feature, and I looked up the word pattern, and I was shocked at how few uh, articles and lessons and things there were about it, because uh, it's kind of something we talk about, not infrequently, where Paul being our pattern. If you'll turn to 1 Timothy 1.16, this is the verse that typically comes to mind when people talk about Paul being their pattern. Now, of course, you, you and I know that, that people who don't understand mid-Acts Pauline dispensational right division, they've never heard that Paul could be a pattern for anything. That, that, is, that is news, right? But people who travel in these circles of knowing that Paul was given a special revelation from God, they're familiar with this idea you know, because there's an attack that's often given, which is, well, I don't follow Paul, I follow Christ. I hear you saying Paul, Paul, Paul all the time, so you think you, you know, you're magnifying Paul and you follow him and all this kind of thing. And so we point out verses like 1 Timothy 1.16, where Paul himself says, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first... Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. And so Paul, Paul refers to himself as being a pattern, and uh, it's kind of for a big audience. If you see the end of that verse, who's he a pattern for? To them which should hereafter, that's Paul and later, believe on Jesus Christ to life everlasting. Well, that's a lot of people given that that was 2,000 years ago. And uh, so Paul's making this claim that anybody who's going to believe on Jesus Christ for life everlasting from him until present day, where we're at in 2020, uh, they've, they've got to consider Paul as a pattern. Now, this verse is specifically talking about Paul being a pattern in terms of how he was saved. And I am not talking about the experience that he had on the road, of Damas uh, the road to Damascus in Acts 9. That is when he was saved. I'm talking about how his salvation occurred in this way. He was persecuting God. He was an enemy of God. In fact, in the verse prior, uh, it, it talks about how, uh, how Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. He was leading the rebellion of sinners against God and what he was doing prior to Acts 9. And in Acts 9, Jesus Christ does something unprecedented that had never been done before, which is to actually grant unto a sinner his righteousness and salvation. Not because the sinner did anything right. Paul wasn't doing anything right according to God. Even though he, he says later, and, and we learned that he thought he was serving God in a pure conscience, he realized that he was wrong. And Jesus saved, Paul, or saved Saul by... God's grace, right? Saul didn't deserve to be saved on the road to Damascus in Acts 9, and Jesus provided that salvation for him anyway. And so Paul says, this is how God is operating now with people. God, God has never saved a person that wasn't in good standing with him prior to that. In fact, I've made the point before in a number of lessons about people being saved while they were alive isn't a thing. It's just not a thing. Uh, I got a lot of flack in one seminar lesson when I made the very bold claim that I still stand behind that Peter wasn't saved when he was walking around on the planet. <laughs> right? Of course, that was the uh, seminar that we were, we were trying to define what salvation is. So when we're talking about somebody being saved, we're talking about them having salvation, right? And the whole weekend we spent talking about what salvation is and what salvation isn't. And when you look at Peter's own testimony, he testifies to not possessing salvation. Even though he might have been in the right standing with God in the covenant that God had presented for Israel to be in and for that remnant to follow, he might have been in right standing and had faith in what God was saying. He did not possess salvation because that was still yet future. Just read 1 Peter 1. You know, read Acts chapter 3. He's talking about future salvation, right? So here, 
Paul is the first person to actually receive salvation while he's still alive on the planet. And not only that, but he didn't deserve it one bit because he wasn't doing anything that God would want people to do. So, so he's a pattern of God's grace in that way. And that's what 1 Timothy 1.16 is talking about, okay? And so that's usually, um, that's usually the, the way that, that 1 Timothy 1.16 is explained, and that is correct in the context, okay? But people also, mid people also talk about Paul being a pattern in other ways, right? And they talk about Paul being, uh, having given the dispensation of the grace of God, it was given to him to dispense to others. And so Paul's a pattern in his doctrine, right? This is kind of how people talk about Paul being a pattern. You know, Paul was given this information, this new information, the mystery information that was hid and is now revealed. And so he's our, that's where we go, Paul's letters is where we go to find the instructions for the church. And so he's a pattern in that way, right? The wise master builder kind of idea where he's laying out the instructions. And if you want to know what the instructions are for you, that's where you have to go. Um, and you're familiar with these passages. I've listed a number of them um, on your outline there in Ephesians 3 primarily, where he says that the dispensation of the grace of God was given him to you word, right? And so he's kind of this, this, uh, this vehicle through which God's instructions about the dispensation of the grace of God and the mystery are being dispensed and put forth. And so we talk about Paul being a, a pattern in that way, though we don't really have a verse that, that, that calls him a pattern, but it's an accurate thing. And then as I alluded to earlier, one attack that people who uh, take the mid exposition that Paul was giving something, given something unique and new uh, for the church, uh, you, you get accused of, of following Paul and not Jesus. And so people, they want to say things like, uh, they, they want to try to diminish what you're saying about Paul by claiming that Jesus is more important than Paul, and so I'm going to follow Jesus and not Paul. And so, um, you know, so, so Mid-Ex people in, in, in retort to that, in defense, you know, they say, well, I'm following Jesus by following Paul. And this is a right thing to say. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 4, we can look there real quick. There are several places where Paul tells members of the body of Christ to follow him as he follows Christ. 1 Corinthians 4, 16. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me, right? And if you keep on going even, he says, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. And so apparently Paul's got these ways that he's teaching and, and things that he's doing everywhere in every church, and he wants the Corinthians to follow him in those things, Right? And, and so we, we aren't, in chapter 11 in 1 Corinthians, verse 1, we aren't, we aren't facing a lack of biblical support where Paul is instructing people to follow him. And in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, he even says, as he follows Christ, right? Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And so the, the mid-Acts retort is, well, yeah, I follow Jesus too. Jesus Christ sent Paul. And this is the right response. This is the right, the right way to handle that, that situation. Uh, Paul calls himself the wise master builder. If you want to be a builder and you want to build on that foundation properly, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 3, then you must be able to follow the plans laid out by the master builder. And that's him. Uh, Philippians 3, let's turn there. There's a couple places in Philippians where Paul also gives this instruction. In Philippians 3, 17, Paul says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as ye have us for an ensample. So he's not only telling the Philippians that they need to be followers together of him, but to look out for other people who are as well and mark them and say, hey, that person is following Paul as a pattern. That person is following Paul as a pattern, right? Uh, if you turn over to chapter 4, in verse 9, I wrote this verse on the top of your outline, but this was, this is, there's something in this verse that is different than, slightly different than the others, or at least it's more clear, and was kind of the springboard for the, the main point of the lesson tonight. All these things that we've talked about are true about Paul being a pattern. I don't want to take away anything from that, but it's been my experience that that's about where the teaching of Paul being a pattern Stops, 
those, those three things, right? It's his salvation, which is true. His salvation is a pattern for anyone who wants to be saved now and the prior 2,000 years and, and the future from now until God is done with this dispensation. And, and no one knows when that will be. And we pray for God's long suffering that it will be long before that happens. So he's a, he's a pattern for our, for our salvation. He's a pattern in, in the sense that the doctrines of the church, which the body of Christ is what we are, what we comprise, we're looking for our pattern in that. Where do, we, where do we get those instructions? And he has those things. And that he is the wise master builder. We follow Christ by following him. Okay, and these, these are the three ways that he's a pattern. And these are all true. I don't want to diminish that. But I think there's more to it than that about Paul being a pattern. And Philippians 4 and 9 kind of gives us a clue into what that might be. Paul says to the Philippians, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard, and seen in me, do. Now, to me, those four things, things learned, received, heard, and seen, seems like there might be more in those four things than even just the three things we talked about, right? Because nobody that he's writing to saw Paul's salvation, that's for sure. And he's saying things that you saw in Paul do. You can't really do salvation anyway, which is another interesting part of the verse where he's actually giving them a command to work, to do something. You know, grace folks sometimes are attacked by saying, oh, you, you're just telling people they don't have to do anything, that it's all free grace for, you. for your salvation. Yes, and that's been a bit of a theme that's come up this year here in our teachings at Grace Ambassadors where it's like salvation and service are both important and they're different, right? Your salvation doesn't require any of your work. It's Christ's work. But your service requires all your work. That's you who does the work for the service, right? And, and so he's, he's addressing that issue somewhere in here because clearly he's not telling people to work for their salvation in this verse. That's not, the, that's not at all the point of the context. He's telling them to remember him and the, the way that they saw him be, the way they saw him live, the things that they learned from him, the, the things that they heard him say, and the things that they apparently received of him. He wants them to do those things. And that's not something that grace people are real comfortable talking about a lot of times. Right? When, when a grace person starts talking about the things that you need to do, people start getting a little antsy. And maybe rightfully so, if the person saying that hasn't proven themselves to you that, that they are clear on what salvation is according to the dispensation of the grace of God. So there's always a place to be wary and, and have you know, flags ready in case they need to be thrown. But we do need to be comfortable with the idea that God is wanting us to do things. Right? He, he did save us to be servants of righteousness. Servants of righteousness aren't, I mean, that, that means you do something to fulfill that, right? That's a title you've been given, but if you don't ever do anything, then what you're not really serving, right? I mean, you've got the title, but you're not fulfilling that which you've been called to do. And so that's kind of where I wanted to move the discussion about Paul being a pattern, because we've established those other uh, points where you know, salvation, doctrine, uh, uh, pattern of, of being the master builder, this is all true, but there's something that Paul wants the Philippians to remember about him and the way that he carries himself in this life so that they would do what he was doing. What does that mean? What does that look like? So I just wanted to flesh that out a little bit this evening um, and, and see what, what we can find. And so I think you could teach a lot of lessons on this idea, but in trying to keep it somewhat concise and somewhat in a framework, I wanted to do it in the framework of, of uh, doing God's will, because I, I think it could be more than that, but we're just going to stick to that tonight. Ephesians 5, 17, Paul instructs the Ephesians that they should not be unwise and that they should know what the will of the Lord is. And we've talked about this in many lessons as uh, over the years, when you understand the Bible rightly divided, you can know God's will. It, it just, it says it very plainly. The problem people have with God's will, of course, is it's not specific enough for them, right? <laughs> like they want God's will to be very specific. And God's will is, um, let's just say it's bigger than you. It's more important than you. And it, it doesn't really concern the details about you, right? Because God's will is about eternity. And God's will is about Him and His grace and being able to provide blessings to people uh, and, and to remove the curse from people and the earth. This is God's will. That's a little bigger than you and I individually. And so people get disappointed when they hear that. 
but uh, they, they fail to realize the greatness of, of that plan and that purpose, right? But uh, God's will is defined for several places in the scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is a place that clearly states that, God's will. If you start, um, there's a whole list of things here, but you can start in verse 16. Real, real easy. God's will for you. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you want to know what God's will is for you, well, there, Paul just listed a few things to the Thessalonians to wrap up that letter. And so maybe this is one of the ways that Paul is a pattern for us in doing God's will, right? These three things, rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks in everything. This is, the Bible says this is God's will for us. Paul uh, is a pattern for us in these ways. And we can, we can pick up on this very clearly just by doing a cursory look at, uh, at the letters that Paul wrote. Um, did you know that Paul talks two and a half times more? I'm going to do a little math on you, okay? You got to try to figure all the numbers out. More about joy, glory, and hope than he even uses the word grace. I, br I brought this up in uh, the, one of my lessons that I taught in the seminar, and uh, it was kind of surprising to people. Let's, let's put up a little chart here. The word grace we find in Paul's epistles in an abundance compared to uh, all the other writings of Scripture. And uh, just for tonight's lesson, we're going to just look at the four Gospels. We're going to break up Acts into pre-Paul and post-Paul just so that you can see some interesting things. Okay, then we're going to put Paul here, which of course is Romans through Philemon, 13 epistles. And then we've got Hebrews through Revelation to wrap up the New Testament portion of the scriptures. Okay, Matthew through Revelation, the word grace. This is not hard if you have a concordance or a word, uh, uh, whether that be in a book or in a, in a computer software or something like that. The word grace shows up five times in those four books, okay? It shows up once in Acts 1 through 8, and it shows up nine times starting in Acts 9. Just interesting to see where there's, there's a line there, okay? Hebrews through Revelation, the word grace appears 17 times. Paul uses the word 93 times. And so this has been pointed out before as, just by looking at the words, Paul apparently has something to say about grace that other people didn't need to take the time to talk about. What does that mean, right? Now, this, again, this is just a word count, right? But just, it's just interesting to see that just by doing word counts, those numbers tend to point you in a direction, right? And so this has been thrown about before, and, and people who understand the dispensation of the grace of God, the manifold wisdom of pure grace was given to Paul. And so, of course, he's going to talk about that a lot more than the other portions of the New Testament of your, of your Bible. But this is where I thought it was really interesting. These things that we're wanting to talk about tonight, like glory and joy and hope. I should use different colors because that's fun. Glory. Now this one is a little more here. That's a lot, right? Glory is talked about 60 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a total of nine times in Acts, and 48 times in Hebrews through Revelation. You know how many times Paul talks about glory? 123 times, which is obviously more than the other places, just like the word grace. But what I found astounding is this right here. We say Paul is the apostle of grace. He's the apostle of the Gentiles, for sure. He calls himself that. Um, he's the apostle of the resurrection because he's the only of the apostles that started his ministry after Jesus' resurrection, which is telling in terms of proving uh, that Christ was real and that he resurrected. But he talks about, just by word count alone, talks about glory way more than he talks about grace. Interesting to think about, right? So you could also say that Paul is the apostle of glory, and that would be a more appropriate description than even Paul the apostle of grace, because he talks about glory more than he talks about grace. 
In line with this uh, glory idea is, is uh, the word joy, where you have 39 times... Now, I'm not being consistent. Where you have 39 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have 11 times in Acts, you have 23 times in Hebrews through Revelation, and you have 63 times here. So if you want to know who in the New Testament portion of the Bible talks the most about joy, it's Paul, which I think is fascinating because he wrote five of his letters in prison, right? And he talks about all the afflictions and the persecutions that he endured wherever he went. And people were chasing him out of town and he was stoned and beaten and died. And, I, and he's the one that talks about joy the most. Just interesting to consider in terms of him being a pattern, right? This is the point of the lesson tonight. It's like, well, if we're going to look at Paul, what are the things we can receive from Paul? What are the things we see in Paul? Like he told the Philippians in chapter 4, uh, well, we're seeing some things. We're learning some things about him just by counting words. Like, we're, and I'm not talking about numerology and any. Don't get, don't go there. Uh, we're just just looking at the text and saying, well, you know, how, where does he mention these things and what does he talk about? Hope. These things are, are things that I think people want to almost define Christianity by, and rightfully so. Like, these are things that are very important, should be very important to Christians, right? Just notice where that comes from in the New Testament portion of your Bible, right? Hope. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Word, twice. Acts, one time before Acts 9, nine times after Acts 9, 11 times in Hebrews through Revelation, and Paul, 43 times. So you say, well, that's not as much as those things. No, it's not, but compared to these other places, where do you want to learn about hope? I mean, if you need to go to the Bible to learn about hope, <laughs> this is obvious where you need to go, right? You're not going to find much about hope here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts, or even in the Hebrew epistles. You're going to have to go to Paul to learn about hope. So in terms of how he's a pattern for us, well, if you're looking, for, uh, uh, trying to figure out how to live this life and do God's will by rejoicing evermore, like how does a person rejoice? Well, the... Rejoicing in joy, you, you, that, there's that root word there is the same, right? When you take joy in something, you're rejoicing in it, right? Uh, and, of course, you can rejoice when you know that you have a hope of glory, right? That's, where our re, that's the, the, the content of where our joy comes from, is because of the, the salvation that we have presently, and, and we know what's coming. Uh, as sons of God, we know what's coming in the future. And so our joy comes from these things, and Paul is definitely the place where we find how to rejoice. Like, he's the one talking about it, right? So in terms of him being in a pattern, we're actually going to have to learn what he says about these things in order to do the command that he gave for Thessalonians 5, 16, which is to rejoice evermore. Uh, you're not going to know how to do that unless you know how Paul does it because he's the one that talks about it the most, okay? The second thing in our list of God's will, 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. And Paul uh, is an example to us in this way too. Paul either in every epistle except for two, in the first chapter, he either prays right there in the letter or he talks about his prayers to the people he's writing to. Like So he either writes out a prayer or he says, this is what I prayed about. In every one of his epistles in the first chapter, he does this, okay? Except for Galatians and Titus. It just, he didn't there. But uh, 11 out of the 13 epistles, he starts right off with prayer, right? Which is interesting to consider, a spiritual application. If Paul is our pattern for doing the will of God, and the will of God is to pray without ceasing, and you say, well... Surely he doesn't mean like pray all the time. No, clearly, he, that you wouldn't be able to do anything else if you were praying all the time. That's clearly not what it means. But the idea is that there isn't a bad time to pray. And anytime you have the opportunity to pray, then why wouldn't you? We tend to think, we, we tend to forget what kind of a blessing prayer is. Like the fact that we have access to speak to the God of the universe, the creator of all things, and speak to him about anything. That is an amazing blessing. 
right? Mid-Acts people struggle with prayer because we don't know how to pray as we ought, and we learned how to pray wrong, and I don't want to pray wrong, and so it's just easier if I don't, right? I don't know what to pray for, and so it feels awkward to pray. You know, these kinds of things are very common, very common, but, but you can learn how to pray under grace because you have a pattern for doing so, at the very least. You have a pattern for doing so because Paul talks about prayer a lot. He writes his prayers out. He talks about, he writes in the letters what he prays for if he doesn't just make the, the prayer plain right there in, in, the, uh, in the letter itself, right? So we can, we can learn a lot on how to do that just by taking him as a cue. Another thing that you can, you can glean from this idea that Paul starts all of his letters out with a prayer is maybe it's not a bad idea to start things out with prayer, right? That's a good way to focus your mind. We've defined prayer in lots of different ways over the years, and one of the best ways that I like to define prayer, obviously that's, that's you talking to God, right? That the communication happens by God talking to you, and then you hearing God, and then you talk that back to God, right? And the best way to pray is when you're praying the things that you're hearing back to Him, right? That's the best way to pray, is to take the things that you're hearing and, and, and pray them back to him. I'm not talking about reciting verses necessarily. I'm talking about concepts, right? Like, uh, we're not, it's not like rote, like you're just going to read, recite these things back to God that you've read. I, I suppose you could do that, but if you read the things that Paul writes that he prays about, they're doctrinal things. Like, they're things that you learn about grace. They're things that you learn about who God is and the things that you learn about who you are, who He's made you to be. And you pray those things back to Him. To And what that does is that, that activates that doctrine that, that you learned. It, activate, it activates it into your soul, right? Um, doctrine becomes real when you put it to use. If it's in your head, you know it, but, you, but it's not it's not. Uh, really making itself manifest in you. It's not coming out in you necessarily. Most of the time, it's not. It's not until you are forced to engage with it in some way, whether it's communicating it to people or, or you know, teaching it or just having a conversation or actually working it out, like there's something happening in your life and you've got to, you, you've got to rely on this doctrine that you know to actually do this thing that would otherwise be really hard to do. Or how am I going to get through this thing? Well, you know doctrine. And so when you take that step to put that doctrine to practice, and, and you know, then, then it becomes resident in you. And so there's these different ways that the doctrine gets activated. But one of the easiest ways to activate the doctrine is with prayer. Because it doesn't require a circumstance that you have to apply it to. You can take everything that you're learning, and you can, even if you're just thankful to God, back to God for what you were learning, it forces you to rearticulate it, right? Because you don't always have an audience with people that you get to speak the doctrine you're learning to in a way that you've learned it, right? If you're doing it right, when you're talking to other people and, and wanting them to grow in the knowledge of the truth, if you're doing it right, you're really not just like spouting off all the stuff you know. That's a bad way to talk to people, right? The best way to talk to people is to find out where they're at and to carefully choose, you know, which arrow you're going to fire or to carefully choose which step you're going to take as you move forward in this conversation, that's the best way to handle talking with people, right? <laughs> it's a bad, it's a bad way. You, you're going to lose a lot of opportunities if somebody knows that every time they sit down with you, you're just going to unload <laughs> everything that you just learned on them. You don't really even understand it yourself, right? But one of the ways to, to get that understanding and to make it resident in your soul is to pray those things back to God, even if it's just thanking Him for those things specifically that you're learning, not just, but we're working with the kids on this with prayer. It's like we're trying to encourage them to be less broad. Thank you for all your blessings. That's fine. That's good. Good first step, thanking God for the blessings. Why don't we thank God for some, what are those blessings? You know, because there are a lot of grace people who know Ephesians 1.3, that we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And you say, really? Like what? And they go, blah, 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 blah. Uh, what? All of them, I guess. <laughs> well, uh, well, which, which, what are, what are those? All of them, you know. It's like because I guarantee, if if my kid, if my kid said, uh, I said, how many toys do you have upstairs? You know, I got all the toys upstairs. He says, well, well, which ones do you have? I got them all. Yes, you know, like you got them all, D but they could tell you which ones, right? They're gonna say, well, I've got my my Legos and I got my little my thing and I got and they're gonna tell you all the toys they have because they're really excited about it, right? Not grace people. They don't want to say that out. They just know they got them all. Check that off the list. Moving on. 
If people would actually take the time to study what all the spiritual blessings are, one, you can't exhaust that, so that's helpful. But two, if you actually knew what the blessings are, maybe you could actually realize them. Maybe you could actually live them, right? Put them into practice, and that would be a part of your life, which would be a great, a great blessing to you to do. And so Paul is an example in just how we communicate to God the things that he's communicated to us so that, one, when we... When we need to activate doctrine within us, it's, it's a, you're able to do that without requiring some other circumstance or some other person. God is able to furnish you in that way. But two, when you start out the things that you set to do with prayer, then your mind is put in the proper place, right? If you're praying right doctrine back to God and you're being sincere in your prayer back to God, then you're putting your heart and your mind in the right place before you start out on this thing. And even if that's a mundane earthly thing, I think that's an okay thing to do because the mundane earthly things are the things that are easy, easiest for us to get distracted with. And so if we can start those mundane earthly things out with some prayer, then maybe that will help guard us from being overtaken by those mundane earthly things that we maybe have to do, right? And so it, just because we don't see how this thing is very much aligning with doing God's will, maybe if we take the time to pray beforehand, we can sort that out and, and feel uh, feel better about how, how God has called us to operate in this world, even among the things that we're given to do that, are, that, are, uh, that don't seem important or seem like something that maybe would matter to God. Right? But Paul's prayers are always prayers of praise and thanksgiving, and, uh, and that's a good thing to pray about too, right? is, is to pray for that. And then, and then the other content of his prayers are generally considering others. Most of the times that he prays in that first chapter of nearly every book, he says, I always thank my God for you. So he's, he's expressing to the people he's writing to that he prays for them, and then he goes on to say how. So it's not just that we're praying for other people. Again, opportunity working with the kids, you know. Uh, and we thank you for Grandma and Grandpa, and we thank you for Bob and Susie. It's like, and that's good to remember people, but what is, what is a, a better way to pray is like what Paul patterns for us, which is, I thank my God for Bob, who is learning that, you know, your truth is, is you know, what he needs to stand on. He doesn't need to be influenced by this and that. And he's, you know, and so you're actually considering Bob's actual state of things and not just that Bob exists, right? Which is a fine thing to be thankful for. We're happy that you all exist and we exist in each other's presence. Wonderful. But let's maybe grow a little bit in how we consider people and how we pray for them and consider the things that they actually need or the things that they're growing in, right? And uh, th there are a few times you find in Paul's prayers where he prays for things that he ought not. And so you can find a pattern there to learn the lesson that, listen, Paul, in his office and in his position, had a mistake every now and again, didn't he? Right? That doesn't excuse our mistakes, but what it does is it shows us how, I mean, how we could be better at doing the things God has asked us to do. Paul prayed for things that he shouldn't have prayed for. At the very least, he learned that God wasn't going to answer those things the way that he thought they were going to be answered, right? But he did pray for some things that, that he knew the answer already before he prayed, if he prayed it anyway. Just interesting that he records that. We've got lessons on Paul's prayers on the website, and that fleshes all that stuff out. You can go check that out on your own. But anyway, consider Paul's prayers. That's a long study. That's a long study. Just to go find all of Paul's prayers, because there's multiple ones in every book, there's like at least four in Romans. Um, he's, and like I said, he starts out at the beginning of, uh, of most every book with a prayer. Ephesians, he's got prayers at the beginning, prayers in the middle, and prayers at the end. And of course, he's writing this from prison. And so you, think, you figure, well, he's, he, now he knows how to be abased because he's in prison. And so he's praying to God every opportunity he gets, even multiple times writing a letter. And, uh, but none of those prayers... Ironically, when he writes those prayers in prison, none of those are prayers of despair. They're very glorious prayers and magnificent prayers, and he's praising God uh, about his greatness and all the wonderful things that he is. He's doing this from prison. It's like, that's a pattern that if we learn to follow, uh, would really grow some people spiritually and make some people strong in that way. So study Paul's prayers. That's a great way to learn how to pray uh, how to pattern your prayer life after. It's a great thing to do, okay? We got our little chart up here, so we might as well... 
Oh, I erased it. Well, in talking about this last part of uh, God's will in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, in everything, give thanks. And then he, he sums it up, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The, the content of most of Paul's prayers uh, is gratitude, is thankfulness. And um, he talks about thankfulness and gratitude and giving thanks 45 times in his epistles compared to the 18 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the five times in Hebrews through Revelation. So his 45 times of talking about being thankful and having thanksgiving and giving thanks, it, it just, it's a magnitude compared to the rest of the New Testament portions of the Scripture. Where do you find how to be thankful in Paul's letters? He's thankful all over the place. He's thankful all the time. Okay. So given that's the will of God for us, is to be thankful in all things, we need to learn how to do that by following our pattern, Paul, in doing that, in doing so. <clears throat> so stepping back a little bit then, we're talking about how is Paul a pattern for doing the will of God? We've read some things that are the will of God in 1 Thessalonians 5. If you back up a chapter to 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul uses this phrase, the will of God, again, In verses 3 and 4, he says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. God's will is for you to know how to possess your vessel. That is, in case you didn't know, your body. The thing that you're traveling in, this body, is your vessel. It's the thing that you move around and exist in this uh, in this physical earth in, and God's will is that you know how to possess it, that you know how to use it, you know what to do and what not to do with it, right? Uh, Ephesians 2.10 says that God ordained us un that we should walk in these good works. He ordained us unto good works. That means He purposed that the people that are members of the body of Christ should do good things. That was God's purpose from before the world began. Right? There's more to it than that, but that's part of it, right? Is that not only would there be this body of believers who are sons of God, saints, free, spiritual, members of a body who will do what is right. That's what he wants, right? That's what he's ordained, that the members of bodies would do what is right and avoid doing things that are wrong. That's what he wants to happen. Okay, that's God's will. And you, you see this all over the place. <clears throat> Titus 2, 7. Let's turn to Titus. There's lots of places in Titus where he's talking about the good things that members of the body of Christ should do. Titus 2, 7. Now this is an interesting verse because Titus is being told by Paul, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. And we'll get to this making more patterns later. But he's, uh, Paul's telling Titus that he should show himself a pattern of good works in doctrine, un uh, uncorruptness, and gravity, sincerity. But the first thing on the list, a pattern of good works. Interesting. In verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Like he keeps saying it. It's like I, the people in Crete need to do good things. Because they're not really prone to that. And so he's kind of reminding Titus, they need to do good things. They need to do good things. They need to do good things. As you jump down to verse 8, he says it again. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. <laughs> it's like, you, you sense like Paul's urgency with this? Like the whole book of Titus is like, listen, Titus, these people are not doing the things that God ordained members of his body to do. <laughs> they need to do good things. You need to remind them to do good things. Uh, they need to know how to possess their vessel. That's God's will. He wants people to do what is right, not what is wrong. And so he's, he's really hitting that hard um, with Titus. But we can learn from Paul the pattern for, for that this is appropriate thing, that good behavior is appropriate thing. We learn this from Paul, again, I'm not digging out, like, 
we're not going deep and long on certain passages that describe this, right? I'm just looking at Paul generally. How can we learn how to do God's will? And in this instance, it's doing good things, possessing our vessel rightly. How can we look at Paul as a pattern for that? I mean, how do we get, like, how do we see how he behaved? Well, there are some ways that we can go through and flesh all that, but just generally, when you consider the layout of Paul's books, how he structures the way he communicates to the people in these churches. You find something very fascinating. I'm going to draw another chart up here for you. Okay. <clears throat> Paul wrote 87 chapters in his 13 epistles. Okay. I don't know why there's a picture. And if you look at the way that he lays those out, we're going, to do, we're, going to, we're going to do something that we have been learning how to do in our ambassadors' workshops on our Bible study practicums where we're learning how to study the Bible together. And one of the things that we learn how to do is how to look at a passage or a chapter or a book and, and kind of give a summary. Just give a general idea, like what's going on here? What's he talking about here? What's, what's the main point, okay? We're going to go, we're going to zoom out even further than that. And we're going to assess the chapters that Paul wrote, and we're going to weigh them out a little bit. And we're going to say, is this, is this chapter like a doctrine chapter where Paul's like teaching, 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 teaching? Here's what you got to know. Here's what you got to know. Or is this chapter more like a, a behavior chapter? Okay, it's like, no, this is what you got to do. Do this, do this, do this. Don't do that, don't do that. Right? You, hear, you see the difference? Because there's places that are like that. Uh, we just looked at Titus. Practically the whole book of Titus if you summarize each chapter, it's like he's, he's naming all these things that people need to do or don't do, right? In chapter 1, he's talking about how they need, don't be liars, you know, don't do evil things, these people are being nasty, don't do that, don't do that. Chapter 2, he's like, instead do this, do this, do this. And it's not that there isn't the intertwining of doctrine and, and behavior. I'm tr we're trying to take a high view of it. We're trying to zoom out a little bit, right? Is, is this chapter mainly talk about doctrine? He's not really instructing, like, go do something. He's just, you know this, explaining something. Or is it behavior, right? And it's interesting to see when you, when you, uh, when you lay all this out. I don't know. I don't want to waste your time with it. But uh, in Romans, uh, we're going to call it uh, chapters 1 through 11 are doctrine. And chapters 12 through 16 our behavior. Are you familiar at all with some of the passages in Romans? Like if we went to like Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, that's like some doctrinally meaty stuff. Like he's not giving anybody any instruction on what to do. He's explaining salvation in a real thick way. He's just laying out the whole doctrine. And then uh, you know, we get to like chapters 9, 10, and 11. He's not even talking about what to do. He's talking about Israel. So he's laying out more doctrine about Israel. And then all of a sudden you get to chapter 12, and it's like this list of things. Like, uh, just turn there. Just turn there so that we can get an idea of, we're not going to do this detail through every book. But I want you to see what I'm talking about here. People, Romans chapter 12. Uh, say like in uh, verse, what, 9, just start there. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another, right, and brotherly love. And prefer one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing us in prayer. Does that sound like doctrine to you, or does that sound like pay attention to some things that you need to do here? It's a, it's a list describing behavior, right? Okay, and and chapters 12 through 16 are generally that, right? Generally talking about all this kind of, 14 is all about how the people who know some things are treating the people who don't know some things wrongly and they need to get that fixed, right? 15 is like how you're going to treat these people down in Judea, generally speaking, right? So he's talking about behavior like 25% of the time. And here 75% of the time. You've got all this doctrine and then there's this little bit of behavior, which is I think how most grace people would like it to be. It's like, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. I have liberty. I'm free. You can't tell me what to do, right? Paul he talks about doctrine 75% of the time. And then he just does some little tips at the end, right? And that's the end of it from there.
If you start breaking down all the rest of the books, they're all looking a little different. The Corinthian books are unique. They're kind of a 50-50 split. In 1 Corinthians, they got problems, behavioral problems, but more so doctrinal problems. Every chapter, he's like, there's this teaching, and here's your wrong problem. And there's this teaching, and here's this problem you got. And here's this teaching, and here's this behavior issue that we got to deal with, right? Every chapter. 2 Corinthians is a little more different. And again, we're trying to be general and vague, just so we get the idea. 2 Corinthians just spreads it out a little bit more, right? So he gives like a teaching for like a chapter, and then he addresses this issue that's going on for a chapter. And then there's this teaching for a chapter, and then there's this, this issue that he deals with. And so the Corinthians, there's like a 50-50 split on doctrine and behavior, right? And you see a similar kind of thing in uh, Galatians all the way through 2 Thessalonians, where the first half of those letters, all doctrine. And the second half of those letters, almost always behavior oriented. Just split down the middle. Galatians and Ephesians have six chapters. It's pretty clear, almost three and three. Colossians and Philippians, four chapters each. First two chapters, think of Colossians, if you will. Those first two chapters are so thick, full of doctrine. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're completing Him, and there's no other thing. And He just lays all this thick doctrine out, and then all of a sudden, he hits chapter 3, and he starts talking about how they're going to relate to one another. And he does that for the next two chapters, just talking about how they behave, how they act, right? And so it's, it's almost always like that. And then you get to um, the Timothys, and it starts swinging the other way. Right? The Tims, he spends the first quarter or so, usually like the first chapter, laying out some doctrines. And then he talks about behavior in the church because Timothy is kind of in charge of this church in Ephesus. And he's like, so Timothy, you know, know some things. And now we got to fix these problems that are going on with the people in your church. Make sure that they don't do these things. Make sure they do these things right. And then as we just saw in Titus and Philemon, it's practically, he, he, there's really not a whole lot of doctrine to discuss. Now there's doctrines in there. I'm not trying to say there isn't doctrine where Paul talks about behavior. And I'm not trying to say that he never addresses behavior in the chapter he's talking about doctrine. I'm just trying to give like a summary. Right? If you just try to take a consensus of the point of what Paul is writing in all of his books, the score ends up being 41 chapters of doctrine to 46 chapters of behavior. Interesting thing to consider. Okay, And again, so we're just kind of looking generally at Paul and how he's communicating in the scriptures. What's he talking about? We looked at words earlier. He's talking about grace. He's talking about hope and glory and joy and thanksgiving. And he prays all over the place. So just generally looking at how Paul communicates in the scriptures, we see that he is fulfilling the will of God. We're looking at things that God says is his will. Paul is fulfilling those things just by the way he writes his letters. He speaks more about how the doctrine works out of them than he does about the doctrine itself. Just interesting to consider because God's will is that people would know how to possess their vessel. God's will is that we would walk in good things, that we would do good things and avoid bad things, right? So you got to know what those are. What is fascinating, however, and this is perhaps the biggest cue to take from Paul on this point, you'll notice the order that he communicates these things. Titus and Philemon accepted from this, he always starts with the doctrine because he wrote 1 Corinthians 15, 33, which is an extremely important verse and wise that most of Christianity has backwards and including grace people. <clears throat> he knows that you'll never get grace doctrine to work out of somebody the right way by putting them under a law. He knows you'll never get anybody's heart changed by just telling them that they need to change their behavior. 
Grace works from the inside out, and that means that your inside has to change. Well, how's that going to happen, Paul? 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications, communications like doctrine, things that you know, things that you're talking about, going in your mind, going in your ears, going in your soul, evil communications corrupt bad manners, right? The manners are corrupted, the manners, the behavior are corrupted by the doctrine, by the communications. So if you want to fix people's behavior, you got to fix the communication. You got to fix the understanding first. If somebody's got a behavior problem, it's because they have a doctrinal problem. First Corinthians is really easy to see that in, okay? Because they had a lot of behavior problems. They aren't the only ones, but they're the most blatant, right? And he's got a doctrinal answer for every one of those things, and he fixes the doctrine first. He fixes the doctrine first, right? He has to ask the Corinthians, don't you know, don't you remember this doctrine I taught you? If you know that doctrine, then the behavior looks like this, right? See, doctrine first, behavior follows. He never just comes in and says, stop doing that. Go do that. Stop doing that. Do that. Now, Romans 12 sounded like that when he was just like listing all these things, right? But he just spent 11 chapters giving them the doctrine. And then he took the time at the end to apply that to the works, okay? So how can we take a cue from that? We got to deal with people. We got to deal with members of the body of Christ. And not, the behavior is not always great all the time, okay? Paul's our pattern. How does Paul deal with behavior? He finds out what doctrine is underneath that bad behavior and deals with that. Let's get the doctrine right. But he also doesn't ignore behavior, which is something that grace people tend to do, right? Is ignore behavior in themselves and in others, figuring that somehow it'll all get worked out. He talks about it very plainly. Like he's not shy about the behavior problems, right? But it's the, it's the right approach that he takes by fixing the doctrine first and then dealing with the behavior. Right? So but that is another interesting way that Paul is our pattern for how we can do the will of God, which is knowing how to possess our vessel and helping others do the same, right? Of course, the most popular verse that we use to talk about what God's will is today is 1 Timothy 2.4. And it, that's, that's a perfectly great verse to use to describe God's will. God that is who the who is in 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. God, our Savior, will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's two, two things there that God would, that God will, what God's will is, what he wants to have to, to see. God's will is to have all men come unto the knowledge of the truth. Let's start with that one and go backwards. Now, there's a lot of different ways we could go with this, but I just thought I would pick out one thing for the sake of time and, and talk about it tonight. <clears throat> Obviously, all of the Bible is God's truth, right? And therein lies a problem that a lot of mid people face, is they're either accused of ripping out the rest of the Bible by saying, your instructions are found in Romans through Philemon, and then don't know what to say to that accusation, right? Like, they know it's not true, but they don't know why, right? Maybe you've been there, maybe you've heard, maybe you know people who are in that kind of situation. It's like, yeah, I know that Paul's, you know, Paul's got the instructions for us today, and their friends are telling them, you know, well, you're cutting out the rest of the Bible, and you're like, no, I'm not, except I am, and like, so yeah, they're stuck. They don't know how to answer that question, right? And here is where I want to encourage us tonight to use Paul as an example. In Paul's 13 epistles, in his 87 chapters, in his approximately 2,000 verses, he quotes Old Testament scriptures over 153 times. And you may think, well, I don't even have a reference. Like, is that a lot? Is that a not? You know, that's about 10% of his writing, a little less, okay? So think about it. 
every tenth thing Paul says, he's quoting Old Testament. And some, of, some people are shaking in their boots at this point. They're like, ah, <laughs> I don't know how to handle it when Paul talks about the Old Testament. I don't know what he's doing when he does that. I don't get it. That's precisely my point. If our apostle, who is our pattern, quotes the Old Testament and teaches from it 10% of the time, why do mid acts people tend to ignore it? And they don't know what to do when Paul quotes Old Testament. They don't have an answer to that response. Like, we, we got to learn something here because our pattern's doing it. So we got to know why he's doing it. And we got to be able to do it like he does it, right? That should be something we're striving to do. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is the verse that people will throw at you when you quote 2 Timothy 2, 15 about rightly dividing the word of truth. They will go to the next chapter and they say, no, you can't throw it all out. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, right? They said, no, 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 we take all the scripture and that should be the cry of every mid acts dispensationalist is I rightly divide the entire scripture. I take the entire scripture and I understand how it's put together. Okay, that is the response to people because Paul himself in the next chapter from rightly dividing, right, says that you need all of it. And not just, and, and not just to say, well, but it's not for you because it's not even true. It's not to you. There's big difference. Words mean things, right? Like we talk about Bible belief and that words matter. Yeah, it is, it is definitely for you. The entire Bible is for you. Look at, look at the verses in 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 again. All scripture is profitable that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now we just got done talking about the good works that need to be done. The man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, with part of the scripture. That's not what it says, right? If you take out part of the scripture, then you can't be truly furnished and perfect. You have to have all the scripture to be truly perfect and furnished. You got you to be okay with that. Like all of the scripture is for you. Romans 15, he says it a little more plainly. Romans 15, 4. Whatsoever things were written aforetime, just call that everything before Paul. Call that everything in the Bible that's not Paul. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Everything in the scripture was written for you. Everything in the scripture was written for you. For your learning. Learning? I got nothing to learn back there. I got to learn from Paul. Paul's got my instructions. That's who I learned from, right? Paul even said, learn from me. And the guy who said, learn from me, said, you better learn from the rest of the scripture, too. There are, there are so many rampant doctrinal errors in mid acts camps, it's almost sickening. We catch wind of the circus that exists, especially online. It's like herding cats. It's a mess. And this is the reason why is because all these mid acts people don't know anything but Paul. And the foundation that Paul is building his part of the building on is non-existent. You got no hell. You got no Bible. You got Jesus isn't God. You've got all sorts of craziness being perpetrated by people who are going, Paul, Paul, Paul. And it's because they don't know the rest of the Bible. Like these are fundamental doctrines that mid acts people ought to be strong on. And you get strong on those doctrines by knowing the rest of Scripture outside of Paul. Because Paul builds his mystery case on the rest of Scripture. That's why he quotes Old Testament, to show that he's not a heretic. Because if what he was teaching was completely removed, separated, not even related to in, in one way, the rest of the Scripture, he is a heretic. He is a heretic, right? But he's not because what he's teaching goes right in line with the rest of the scriptures. It's just the manifold wisdom of God. It's the piece that was missing. It's the piece that wasn't revealed yet, but it's built on everything else that's in the Bible. And if you don't know what that is, you're going to make a mess. You're going to take Paul, you're going to run off the deep end with him, and you're going to turn him into something that he's not. Right? And when you mess up your pattern, then you're going to have, 
your way of doing things messed up, and you're going to claim that that's God's will, and now you're a blasphemer. It doesn't go good places. So people have to know their Bibles better than that. Right? Bible belief is the other reason why that happens. Lack of it, I should say. Right? When people have a problem with something that's being taught in the Scripture on any page of it, the, and their solution is to change what the words say, it's a, it's a house of cards. Because what, what's the difference between one and a thousand at that point? If one word's wrong, they're all wrong. Right? So the idea that people don't understand the rest of the Bible and the doctrines taught in it make a mess of mid-Acts. People that won't believe every word in this Bible, that this is perfectly preserved, which, by the way, is something you learn from the rest of the Scripture, that God obligated Himself to preserve His Word, right, for us to use it. You learn that from the other parts of the Bible. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why people can't take that Bible-believing position is because they don't take the rest of the Bible. And I'm talking about mid-Acts people here, okay? So, we can take a cue from Paul to not be afraid of the rest of the Bible, and to learn the rest of the Bible so that we don't mess that up, so that we don't become heretics because they're out, they're out there, right? People were real close to home, unfortunately. So this last part, we'll, we'll end the lesson up here. God's will is to have all men saved. And Paul's office as the apostle of the Gentiles, we talked earlier about how his salvation was a pattern for everyone after him all of us and everyone for the last 2,000 years who believes on Jesus Christ to eternal life, they're saved the exact same way Paul was saved, by the work of Jesus Christ given freely to sinners. Okay? His experience is not what I'm talking about. It's it, the salvation that he was given there. And so there are these things about Paul that are not our pattern, like his experience, right? Like none of us are apostles, let alone the apostle of the Gentiles. Like, that's a specific office, right? Now, he's no more, he's, he, he, he has no more extra special standing before our head than any of us do, praise God for his grace. But he had a responsibility that God gave him alone that is different than he gave us. And so we do well to, to remember that, you know, there are, there are things that happen to Paul that will never happen to anybody else. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so there are things unique to him. But by and large, his purpose is a pattern for all. His purpose is a pattern for all, right? Turn to 2 Timothy 3. <clears throat> Paul's purpose is God's purpose. While you're going there, 2 Timothy 1.9 says that God saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. See, God's purpose and grace was given to the entire body of Christ. You notice all the plural pronouns He uses in that verse. Because there's a lot of verses where Paul uses my, right? My gospel committed unto me, all these, which is true. But notice in this verse, he doesn't use that. He says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. He gave all members of the body of Christ God's purpose, right? Which is what we've been doing with God's will, right? So Paul's purpose, Paul made God's purpose his purpose. And he might have had a lot less choice in that than we do. He, he kind of says so much. <laughs> He's like, listen, even if I didn't want to, God apparently is going to make me. Right? He says that in, in 1 Corinthians 9. He's like, I, I don't have a choice here. <laughs> right? Uh, that's different than you and I. From the moment you trusted the gospel, you have a choice every second thereafter whether you're going to walk in the Spirit, whether you're going to serve God or your flesh, whether, you know, what you're going to do with the time that you have left in your life. I mean, that, that's all your choice. Paul apparently didn't have as much choice as you do when it comes to those things, right? So there are things specific to him, but generally, his purpose, being God's purpose, he says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, is our purpose, right? And so we can learn a lesson from him on that, that our purpose needs to be God's purpose. I told you to go to 2 Timothy 3 verse 10. Paul's telling Timothy here, Timothy, thou hast fully known my doctrine, 
which we talked about at the beginning. Paul, the pattern of the doctrine, right? Manner of life. We talked about that tonight. Like how to possess your vessel. Like the thing, how you walk and communicate in this life. Your manners. Like the things that you do. Paul says Timothy knew Paul's manner of life. And Timothy knew Paul's purpose. Paul's purpose was to do God's will. Right? Paul's purpose was to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. Paul's purpose was to communicate boldly as he ought, Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, the gospel of the grace of God and the mystery of Jesus Christ. That was Paul's purpose. And your priorities in this life are determined by what you think your purpose is. What's my purpose? Why am I here? Right? Big life question, right? What, what, why do I exist? God purposed his purpose in every member of the body of Christ from before the world began. His purpose for every member of the body of Christ is to do his will. And he provided a pattern for us to see how to do that. And when your purpose becomes God's purpose, you will see your priorities start to change, right? Your priorities will change. 2 Corinthians 1, and we'll wrap it up here. Paul says this. He doesn't use the word priority. But he communicates this thought. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.17 When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? And here's the point I want to make. Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh? That with me there should be yea and nay? Yea, yea, and nay, nay? No, he, he's, he's, contrasting, he's contrasting that his purpose isn't his purpose according to the flesh. His purpose is God's purpose, right? That's what he wants it to, to do. And he's reminding the Corinthians that, listen, my priorities were God's priorities, not what I wanted to do, right? That's a big lesson for us to learn from our pattern, right? That he made his priorities God's priorities. And then in Philippians 3, he talks about the people who, who didn't do that, right? He encourages them we read this verse earlier when he says, Be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so easy, have us for an ensample. And then parenthetically he says in Philippians 3.18, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? He's going to explain. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. When people don't understand their purpose, they don't have a pattern to follow what's left but to follow your own purpose and to follow yourself as a pattern or the world as a pattern. That's the only thing that's left. Protect against that. Paul's warning to the Philippians is be followers of me, right? So that you can stay on the path that God has purposed for you, right? Which is to serve him and do his will. So I hope that was edifying for you this evening. Uh, just to kind of take a different spin on Paul being a pattern and some different ways that he is a pattern that maybe you haven't considered before. Uh, but I will take any questions or discussion at this point.